enable the children to return to school and the staff of the school to be safe. I know my colleague uh, Donald O'Leary um, and Sinn Féin uh, in general have been calling for a roadmap um, for a return to education for a number of months. Um, we were promised it on the 12th of June. What we got was a document that outlined a number of things, including how children might only return a few days a week if social distancing of two metres applied. And then the minister told us um, he wasn't pursuing that. That can hardly be considered a roadmap. Are we going to get a roadmap, or, or is that it? Um, we thought it was very helpful to, to provide an update in terms of uh, making updating the school community in relation to plans towards school opening in June, and it was an important issue to do. We were very dependent on the, the engagement with the health authority so that we could have the health advice available to us. We received that in, in late June and that was published then last week. We will be, we will be providing uh, detailed guidance uh, to, this, to the primary and post-primary sectors. We have already uh, sent uh, uh, initial sets of guidance to the primary sector, to the, to the school principals in the primary sector, but we will be updating that further as a result of the further dialogue, and we're in dialogue about such guidance for the post-primary sector, and we aim to have all of that material completed um, by, by the end of this month. And as I said out in the opening statement, there's a wide range of issues to be covered in the, in the guidance. Yeah, and of course, and I also noticed that um, in your opening statement, you do say that obviously the um, aim is to prevent uh, the COVID-19 going into any school, and that's obviously um, the, the aim of the game. But in the event of a child or a teacher becoming ill, which, you know, with the, with COVID-19 is, is a likely situation. Will the state carry the liability for any cases that may follow, or will the department expect the board of management or patron to be liable? Well, I think the first issue, Deputy, is the one that you've mentioned, and I think uh, it's set out clearly in, in the advice that we have from the health authorities that it's vital that we change the culture in relation to attendance uh, by students and, indeed, staff in relation to schools. That, that students and staff uh, don't push themselves to attend school when, when they are showing any of the symptoms, and that that, that, that is a change of behaviour that's necessary. Also, um, it, it's necessary that the hygiene arrangements are available when, when they come in. When anybody, uh, when the, the guidance from, from the health sector, which we will translate further uh, for schools, will also set out the arrangements that will need to be put in place should anybody fall ill during the school time or should it turn out you know in terms of in terms of, they might not necessarily fall in during school it's possible that, that that it could turn out later that somebody had covid and was in was in a school so we will have to work through how we will handle all of those issues uh, i i don't think it's a question of of liability per se that the schools themselves have their own insurance there's a wide range of, of school of school insurance arrangements in place across different school sectors so I, it's not a, it's not a matter of of um, li liability for insurance I, I i actually don't fully understand liability for what you're you're talking about but um schools have their own insurance some schools have 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 state insurance in the community and comprehensive sector um, Gormag, just on the um hygiene um obviously hygiene as you mentioned there is going to be is a is a very central um, aspect of this whole thing, and um, one thing that um, Sinn Féin have long been calling for is the department to cover all additional um, hygiene costs, as schools just can't bear um, the costs, and, and there would be obviously a concern that that cost would then be passed on to parents. And we know that so many families are struggling uh, financially at the moment. Can the department guarantee that there will be no additional that no additional costs will be passed on to parents, and that schools will get adequate funding? Uh, Deputy, we've obviously been listening very closely, not just to the stakeholders, but to the political discussions, and there's been many interesting and relevant issues that have come up in the, in the, in the COVID hearings on this, and indeed in, in, in more generally broad political discussion on these issues in, in the dial with, with, with our previous minister. We're very conscious of not putting an additional financial burden on schools for these costs, and there will be additional funding available to cover the hygiene costs. Now, that could, could be for the sanitizer. It could be for some PPE, although we would hopefully see that PPE is, is limited enough in its use, but it will also be for cleaning services. So the intention is not that out of existing funding that schools will, 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 will do that. We're also seeking to put in place uh, tendering and drawdown contract arrangements to enable uh, any 
uh, equipment and so on to be more easily available to schools so that they don't have to do it for themselves for the, for the autumn reopening. And um, yeah, on that PPE, um, obviously there's quite a debate at the moment about masks and um, the importance um, of wearing masks. Are you considering either for children or teachers that um, that they should be wearing any form of masks or visors? And of course, that could then have educational impacts. You know, would you see that there be any educational impacts from wearing masks? in terms of a lack of visual cues for children um, with special educational needs? Um, I think the issues that, that you're mentioning there, Deputy, are, are, are absolutely true. I think we have the health advice, and the health advice uh, isn't really suggesting that, that children in, in normal circumstances in, in a school setting would be, would be using uh, any PPE. However, it, there may be a case, particularly for staff work, work, working closely with them, uh, to have PPE. And certainly, the visor would be much preferred over the, over the mask for, for the reasons that you've set out. There, there may also be a need for, for some PPE for older children on, on school transport, and that's referred to in the advice as well. So, um, and we're, look, we're looking at that and talking to Bus Aaron in that regard about, about uh, the older children and the use of masks on, on school transport. But that, there's a real issue, and I, I think it's a very important one that you've raised that the, the, the mask in, an, in a teaching and learning setting. Uh, is a, is, it cuts off the, the nature of contact uh, between between either the SNA or the teacher and, and the student, and that and that a visor is probably a much more suitable uh, na uh, PPE uh, nature of use of PPE equipment, which enables that connection to take place, while also providing the the appropriate uh, protection for staff, which is very very important. Margaret, and I just have two last questions because I know my time is running short. Obviously, um, there's a huge amount of work by all involved um, in delivering this. Will there be additional secretarial supports provided, and will teaching principals get additional release days to allow them to focus on making the school safe? Uh, we we will have we are we are engaging with the school stakeholders about enabling there there to be assistance supports available in terms of leadership time and issues such as that. We, we haven't finalised or firmed up on the nature of those arrangements, but we are very conscious of the need to do so. It's, it's quite clear that uh, schools need to have additional time freed up to manage with the range of activities that will be needed to be put in place and the level of engagement and organisation. So we do have to support that, and we have to support that in an additional way. The best way to do that is really, is really the challenge, and we're working that through at the moment. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fellow. Just a quick, could I just clarify with you the timeline, please, for the guidelines to issue? We we are aiming to have uh, uh, chair. We're aiming to have guidance issued uh, by the end of July at the latest. We recognise that schools need time to prepare, and we will be working on a communications campaign, and we'll be working very closely with the national stakeholders as part of that communications campaign uh, when when we finalise this work. You have a fine balance there between trying to get time to get additional public health guidance and get the guidance out to schools to give them enough time. I recognise the, the practical difficulty with that. Uh, absolutely, uh, Chair. We, we have the initial health guidance, and that health guidance was given to us in late June. So effectively, that health guidance was, was looking at what was happening in Ireland, say, towards the middle of June, but also internationally in other countries and the impact of some school reopenings, particularly in May, because it would take two or three weeks to see the impact. So the health authorities will have will have a better idea about the impact of school openings across other countries in, in the whole of June by the time we have further engagement with them. And they may decide to update the guidance. It, they may decide that the guidance as, as stands doesn't need updating, but I think it's very important that we continue to have the, that engagement with the health authorities. Thank you. Um, okay, now it's uh, time for Fine Gael. Um, who's? Sure. Uh, just in with the I guess uh, just a couple of questions ago. Um, how many additional staff do you expect to have to employ outside of the, the complement that is presently there in these schools? And have you got a breakdown as to the teaching and the non teaching roles? Uh, uh, um, we, we're working through those issues at the moment. We recognise that there will be a need for, for the employment of additional staff. In, in particular, uh, there, there will be a need if, as we we have to free up some leadership time, and there will be a need to cover back for that. We have to, we we, we really have to look at 
at new and different ways of doing substitution uh, for teachers and potentially for SNAs. Uh, we, we have had trialling new systems of, of, of substitution in the primary sector with some, with some, with some panels, and we, we had five panels last year. We also have the option for where, the, where, where small schools and teaching principals have, have, have some days off for administrative days, that they pool those days and that they appoint a substitute to cover over a number of schools. So we're looking at models like that and other models to enable us to, to, to support schools. We, we may also need to have increased substitution uh, because, for example, at the moment, schools cover themselves for the first day of substitution for uncertified leave. Now, that clearly won't be satisfactory to spread children to other classes. That, that's not, not going to be a solution unless um, there may be a very small uh, fraction of classes where that's possible, but it, as a general model, that's not a way, a, a way that we're going. You put a figure on the additional staff complements because I, I feel it could be quite a significant amount of new people needed uh, because, as you say, uh, to keep proper supervision and proper control, uh, substitution for sick teachers and also additional uh, supervision. I think that's a huge issue. Uh, uh, have you got a figure that's, and I can, answer, I can ask you for the question, you give me that answer. For. Uh, we don't have a precise figure because we're working through with the stakeholders and indeed with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform what, what the options are about how we can do that. It, it's, very difficult. it's very difficult to be, to be certain about the precise. In a different way, are you talking about hundreds? Are you, you're probably talking about hundreds of new staff. We're talk, we're, there would be, I, I don't want to put a number on it, Deputy, but they're across the sector in terms of, in terms of the different needs in, and including cleaning and so on, there, is, there, is, there, there will be a need for significant extra additional staffing to cover. The reason I'm asking you this is different ways. I mean, at the moment, for example, um, just have substitutes come in randomly on different days and that works kind of well. We want to minimise that. We want to minimise uh, the number of schools that different substitutes are going to. So we may be able to create more full-time posts while reducing the overall number of, of people who are, are actually... Yeah, I, understand, I understand I'm not expecting you to give me an exact figure, but I do think, uh, I do think with the timeline which our chairperson asked you about, and the, I think you should know, and I'm not being personally critical, you know, uh, you know, big schools are going to need a lot more extra staff. That is a fact, and you're going to have a very short time to get them. And the question of guard clearance is a huge issue as well. Um, and then for staff who are not teaching, the other, uh, they may have, some of them may have uh, guard clearance already, but other people that you're going to need won't. So I think there's a huge issue that needs to be, and I'm not suggesting you're not addressing it, but it need, we, need to, we need to know more facts about it. Uh, the other point I'd put to you, um, that, that when we talk about school transport and the PPE, particularly for children, uh, who's, who's going, I presume you're going to pay for that. And then, you know, the, the question is going to be, and this is an important point, there will have to be somebody accompanying the, the bus driver, an adult, on each bus will have the capacity to control, and I mean, uh, you know, in a, in a general sense, the, you know, the issues that, that might, might arise. So have you thought about that? Okay, uh, thanks, Deputy. I think you're, you're, you're absolutely correct about the need for additional staffing and you're absolutely correct about the need for guard vetting where guard vetting is required and we're conscious of that and we're, that's part of the discussions that we're having uh, with, with the management bodies and, and unions and so on. On school transport, the, the, the same issue applies as with schools where, where in terms of we will pay for the additional cost of any PPE. That's not something that, that, that's, that's something that is important that, that, we will, that we will make available to them and we're, we're in discussions with Bus Aaron about, the, about how school transport will be organised. We have uh, in, in the health advice, the interim health advice, that they have, they have set out uh, the, the arrangements for school transport, which is, is quite positive in terms, of, in terms of the capacity of the school transport system. But at the same time, we do have to make sure that arrangements are put in place to support uh, 
social distancing as best we can and to support groups of children in the same families to sit together on issues such as that and those are the sorts of issues that we're working through with Bus Erin at the moment but I think it's important to note that Bus Erin are in the process of arranging for the school transport system at the moment whatever tendering needs to be put in place and whatever engagement with with students in, and their families in relation to those who are eligible and those who will uh, be able to access concessionary travel. And to, the type of PP you're getting Will every school uh, child travelling on the bus have to have a, a, de a type? Uh, do you designate the type of face mask? Uh, I think this is a general question, really, because uh, there are face masks and there are face masks, and it's it's hard to know which is which is the appropriate one, even for adults, never mind children. Like it's going to be a huge problem, really, isn't it? Um, again, the advice that we have from 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 the health authorities. Uh, is, is encouraging the use of face masks in children aged 13 and over, I think, is it over 13, yeah. And, um, and it would be following the same general health advice in, in relation to the use of face masks as it, that's, in the, that's in the general public. There won't be any particularly unique educational aspect to advice on, on face masks on school transport. It's possible that where there's very close quarters management, for example, for bus escorts and so on, the advisors will be needed in the same way that, that within the school sector, that that, that engagement uh, would be needed for anybody who's assisting somebody with special education needs, because obviously wearing the face mask cuts off the facial expression to a large extent. Okay. Yeah, uh, just, uh, just one last, last question then. Um, so how can you in terms of the even the PPE, have you do you tender nationally or regionally for that, or locally? Or that? I'm just trying to get a definition of the quality. You're absolutely absolutely right, and obviously this is this has been a big issue, especially in the first months of the virus and a very challenging issue. So we have a we have a national tender underway at the moment, and we would envisage drawdown of different aspects of that. And as part of the national tendering arrangement we would envisage delivery to each school arising from the national tender and each school being able to enter an arrangement based on the outcome of the national tender. Thank you, Colonel Margaret. Thank you. Um, Mr O'Folo, just to alert you that one of the difficulties we have with this committee is that because we're in different rooms, I don't think that you can hear or see sometimes if the member is trying to interject back in, just, just to make you aware of that. It's, it's a problem we have in every session, so just to, just to flag it to you. And members have very short time for their questions. Um, so I'm sensitive we've gone a little bit over, but I will accommodate everybody in the same way, naturally. The, the, the chairperson has just come in, and I'm sure he's horrified to come in and see me, having allowed the, the committee go over so much. So I'm sure he'll have strong words with me later, so forgive me the rest of the committee. Uh, Deputy Burke, you're, you're next. Yes, um, thank, thank you very much, um, and thanks to all of the department and the uh, staff for the work that they've done over the last uh, three to four months, which has been a very difficult time for everyone, and indeed to all the teachers and boards of management around the country. Um, the issue I want to raise is in relation to schools, and I'm thinking about a number of schools in my own area where there is a, a difficulty about um, space and I'm thinking of a number of schools, for instance, which are on the programme for um, new classrooms or which are in, in one case in particular where uh, it's on the programme for a totally new school to be built. Um, uh, it's a case where there's 350 pupils in a facility where 70 per cent of the classrooms are prefabs. And I'm just wondering what work has been done as regards identifying additional space for schools where there is that problem of, um, of accommodation at the moment and has there been engagement with boards of management on that issue and how big a problem is it going to be and how big a challenge is it, is it going to be over the next uh, two months to try and identify alternative space? Uh, thanks Deputy. I'm going to ask uh, Mr Hubert Loftus to take that question. Yeah, <clears throat> Deputy, um, I'm the head of the department's planning and building unit. Uh, the deputy be aware that uh, construction uh, ceased across all areas uh, as part of COVID response and uh, projects then remobilised from the middle of May onwards. Uh, so we, we, we had 200 building projects uh, at construction and they, they are now largely remobilised. So our focus now is getting them up and running and getting projects delivered. Uh, the, in relation to issues that schools had in relation to September. Our focus was working through contingency arrangements with them. So we've had detailed engagement with all of the relevant schools, with their patrons, and working accommodation solutions for them. 
and uh, at this point, uh, while we have some work to do with some individual schools, we're satisfied that we'll have a contingency arrangements in place for September. For but, it, but in some schools, for instance, they may not even be on the building programme at the moment, but they are, uh, you know, of capacity, and it now clear, is quite clear that we will need additional space uh, for students because of the, the, the changes and the regulations that would be in place. Uh, will there be additional space acquired between now and the 1st of September to accommodate those schools. And I'm talking about like schools in rural areas now in particular, where it may not be that easy to get additional space, or in, say, growing uh, urban centres where you have a huge increase in population, a huge increase in the young population, and, and it's about sourcing additional space. And are we going to be renting additional space to accommodate those schools? Yeah, and yeah the, these are, this is the engagement that we have had with, with a lot of stakeholders at the moment, with the, with the individual schools, and, and our focus is about making sure there is sufficient space available. And the, the public health guidance is very clear. Maximise the space within the classroom to facilitate the, the pupils in the classroom. Maximise the space within the existing school building. So we, we've had very positive and constructive engagement with, with relevant schools, with patrons, and it's about everyone working together in a constructive way to ensure that, that uh, the school return in uh, at the end of August is as seamless as possible for everyone. And if there's a situation where additional space cannot be identified, are we then going to go through the uh, situation where um, we will have some pupils in between 8.30, 9, 9 a.m. to, to 1 p.m., and then another group of students in from 2 p.m. to, to uh, 4 or 5 p.m.? Uh, will that have to be done in some areas where additional space cannot be identified? I think we're confident, and as the Secretary General made clear, that we're, we're working to have uh, schools reopened at the end of August, start of September, in, in as full and as normal manner as is possible in a safe way. And in terms of individual schools, we're working in a very flexible and constructive way, dealing with any of the particular issues at individual schools. And in relation to schools where you think we may have a difficulty about space, uh, have we an idea of the the overall percentage, and I'm not looking for numbers now, but I mean, are we talking about adding up to 15, 20 per cent of schools, or do you think it's a greater challenge than 15 or 20 per cent? No, like, we, 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 we have 4,000 schools across primary and post-primary, and we, we've had engagement with, with uh, cohorts of schools in relation to that any particular accommodation issues uh, for, for September. And uh, it's, it's only a very small fraction, essentially, at the handful of schools that are most acutely affected. And we're working very closely with those. So we're, we're very confident that we'll have solutions in place. But of 4,000 schools, do you think, will, will, are we talking about five, up to 500 schools that may, we may have a, a challenge with in relation to getting everyone back? There's, a, there's challenge generally for all schools in managing this, and that'll be part of the guidance. But in terms of the particular challenges uh, with with uh, accommodation specifically, uh, this is very much, you know, you know, the, the, the most acute cases are no more than a dozen or so. And what do you think is the biggest stumbling block that you will come across between now and September in dealing with this issue? Well, in, in, ter in terms of the accommod working accommodation solutions, I, I think it's it's a by, by everyone working locally in a constructive way, I'm confident that any stumbling blocks can be, can be managed and overcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Fianna speaker, is it Cormac, Mr. Deputy Dublin, for five or ten minutes? Uh, ten, please. Ten. Thank, you. thank you very much. Um, unless, depending how this goes, we might share um, the ten minutes. Um, just welcome the guests, first and foremost. Thank you very much uh, for your attendance and for your remarks. Uh, particularly the Secretary General and, and his colleagues. Uh, I welcome the change in culture and, and, and message, I suppose, about you know, if you're sick, stay away, uh, and equally your own remarks about the number one priority of your department be, uh, reopening the school. So that's, that's a good place to start. Um, and I spoke with a, a number of the teacher representatives who were here on Tuesday, and uh, it is good to see that everybody's coming from the same side. Can I ask uh, at the start, just for the Secretary General, please, when was planning, when did planning begin, I suppose, to look at the reopening of schools uh, when COVID hit? Uh, how soon did that begin, please? Um, Deputy, thank you. Um, we were conscious on the day we were closing schools 
and we had to close the schools at very short notice, as you will recall, uh, on, on the advice of the health authorities, that it we were immediately conscious that it would be more difficult to reopen schools and there would be more challenges. We did not know what the virus obviously was going to be like, and at that initial time, we were hopeful that the virus would pass more speedily than it has done, while obviously it has been got under control uh, very well in, in society in, in that time. Our, our, immediate, our immediate work was on supporting schools in engaging with their students and advancing with learning in what turned out to be the three-week period before the Easter schools break. And also we had did some immediate thinking around the, the nature of assessment for state examinations, just that had been planned for those three weeks. Okay. As we worked through then, it became apparent that we made the call, uh, the, the, the minister made the call, that schools were effectively closed until further notice over the Easter period. And at that stage, we, while continuing to put a big focus on supporting the learning for the remaining uh, number of weeks, shorter time in second level, while also putting a big focus into looking at the year-end certification, uh, particularly for junior and leaving cert years, we also then began work and reflection and engagement about how schools would reopen. And uh, we initially engaged with for health advice in relation to the examination system, uh, and that was very important. And indeed, we had a particular focus initially on bringing some, some teachers back for sixth year classes in July. And then, but when that became clear that that wasn't possible, we put the, we put the focus on planning for the for the longer run return, which has been September. And as well as that, um, in, in more recently after that, when the health advice changed that it would be possible to bring back some schooling in the summer, we put the focus on the summer provision as well. Okay, thank thank you for that. Um, so, w dealing with the issue of reopening and assuming everything goes uh, to plan and schools are reopened in September. Um, I note this morning there's talk of additional funding for both substitute teachers and for cleaning of schools. And while you touched on the cleansing earlier on uh, with some of the questions, do you have a figure, do you have an amount of what kind of additional money you're talking about, particularly for those principals who may be watching, wondering about additional teachers? Because we know there's a challenge in securing uh, substitute teachers, even at the best of times. So can you touch on that at, at all in terms of cost, please? First of all, on, the, on the, 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 the equipment issue and the sanitising and so on, we, ca we don't and can't put a figure on that because we're in a tender process. So we just have to be very careful about that. But we can give, we can give the guarantee we will fund all of that. But we want to try and get the best value for money, obviously, as part of that as well. Uh, the, the, the principals uh, network bodies and the unions representing principals and the management authorities are working through those precise issues about what the nature of demand is going to be for the additional staff, and we're working through those with them. We can't be definitive about them, but they will involve a mixture of organising substitution better, uh, probably needing to have more substitution given that classes can't be covered for the first day by other teachers, expecting that there will be higher levels of absence, given that we want teachers and other staff and indeed students to stay away if they are showing any symptoms. So we have to work through those issues with them. We, we can't be definitive about the numbers, but we can assure the principals that we are working with their representative bodies and we will have definitive information published by the end of the month. Okay, and then um, just some more questions. In terms of this particular roadmap, once complete and once um, issued out to schools, Will this help uh, with the Department of Children and the re roadmap that's needed for special schools and children with dis disabilities or adults with disabilities? Um, do you have, uh, are, is your department going to be working with the Department of Children on that? A um, couple of issues. The special schools are included within, special schools are included within our, so within, under our department and we're working in, 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 we're working as part of school reopening and indeed sustaining schools being open uh, with, with the special schools and their representatives. We do work very closely with the Department of Children and the people who gave us the health advice and the health authorities had given very helpful advice in relation to reopening creches and preschools and so on. And the advice that they've given us has built upon that advice. We will also have the experience of the creches being open uh, in, in July, which will help inform any further health advice that we have. 
So we have been working very closely with the Department of Children, and we always do. And that we have a particular policy link over preschool, over AIM, uh, which is particularly helping uh, the young the young children in preschools with special education needs. And we're very focused on their transition as well. So we have a range of issues which we work very closely with the Department of Children on. Very good. Um, just two more questions uh, for the Secretary General, Chair, please, and then uh, two questions for Mr Loftus. So I might as well ask them all together. Um, my first question would be in relation to after-school activities. Um, what is the likely guidance to schools in relation to either after-school or extracurricular activities that's based on the school premises? Uh, and the second question is more of a perennial issue, uh, with it, which is the weight of school bags. Um, and maybe this is an opportunity uh, for schools to maybe apply for a fund for lockers uh, to try and actually leave school books uh, in the, on the school premises. And obviously there's a health and safety benefit in relation to COVID if the school, if the school books are left on the premises and not taken back uh, when not... When you know, not necessary. Um, and then, Mr. Loftus, in relation to um, school space and accommodation, if the school itself is small and social distancing is impossible, uh, is there going to be a you know a fund available for either renting additional space or providing additional space, be it porta cabins or whatever else? Uh, is that in the pipeline? And then, secondly, if a school is small. Um, or has small numbers, um, but the school building itself is large and there's a possibility of splitting the classes, will there be an opportunity for schools to apply for additional teachers so that actually those, classes, those class numbers can be reduced, bearing in mind that some of the classes themselves, uh, they're over uh, the, uh, the ratio of um, the normal class sizes. So you might just come back to me on those, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Deputy. Maybe in relation to after school care, and maybe I might even move into the issue of morning as well. Um, we, the guidance that we, that the advice that we have from the health authorities covers these areas as well, and it's also going to be part of the guidance that we issue because it'll have to follow the same general arrangements within the school. And there's a particular importance attaching to uh, uh, breakfast clubs. Uh, after school clubs and so on, especially for children who are disadvantaged, and equally uh, the provision of school meals, which is the responsibility of our colleagues in the Department of Employment and Social Protection. Uh, but that's part of what all has to be done within the role of the school in, in the community as a whole. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll be covering that advice. And indeed, as part of the changes with the current government, the Department of Education is, is taking responsibility for education welfare and will have responsibility for school completion and so on uh, going forward. In relation to lockers, that is a challenging issue um, because we're trying to maximise space, and we, we, that's part of the discussions that we're having with, with our colleagues in, in, the, in, the part, in the partner bodies. Because the use of lockers is something that creates congregation, and we have to be very careful about that. And we also have to be very careful that we have the spaces in the corridors for, for social distancing, because the distancing issue applies within and without the classroom. And I think it's very important that, that, that the children are. As, as far apart as, as is practicable outside of the classroom. So there is, we, we would recognise there will be a challenge in relation to school books and so on, because there, there may not be the same locker space available, but that is one of the issues that we're working through, Dear. working through with, with the stakeholders. Mr Loftus, do you want to comment? Mr Loftus, please. Yes, Deputy. Yeah, no, in, in terms of the guidance that we'll be providing to the school system before the end of July, uh, we'll be making clear how space is managed and how that's done. And to help the school system, we intend to have illustrative classroom layouts provided for schools, which will help them plan space, organise space. And the public health guidance is very clear about maximising space within the school building, within the classroom, to, to, to ensure that there's as much space as possible to facilitate students. And obviously, if there are particular issues there thereafter for individual schools, you know, we'll be available to advise and support them in terms of how that's done. But the public health guidance will be the framework for helping ensure there's that clarity for individual schools. Thank you for that. And just finally, Chair, if I may, just um, where, where the schools have the space and where there's a possibility of facilitating those classrooms, I would urge the department to try and ensure that there is a fund available to those schools to employ additional teachers so those class sizes are reduced and indeed the space is given for uh, socially distanced education. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Deputy Costello, you have five minutes. Yeah, um, 
Just, just picking up there on that last point in relation to school space, you said earlier as well about you know ensuring there is enough space in the school, in the classroom, and uh, provide, having a solution in place if there isn't. But my thoughts turn to schools that just won't have sufficient space to meet the public health guidelines, which I'm sure there are plenty. Um, what do you see as the solutions? Will you be able to support schools if they need to, say, hire the local parish hall or something like that? You know, will solutions that that need force a school, if a school needs to look outside the school gates for a solution, will you be supporting them in in any costs for that? Yes, deputy. Um, I suppose the the first point of call in, in relation to the working through the public health advice is to provide the framework for schools so that they then know how they can manage within the confines of the school building, how can they maximise space within the classroom. And that includes taking a fresh look at each classroom and taking a look to see what is the furniture that's in that that doesn't need to be within it to, to maximise space. Again, taking a fresh look at their, their building generally, what spaces there might be within an assembly area, hall or whatever else. And many schools also have uh, facilities adjacent to the school building, be it the parish hall or whatever. So like all of this, it's all about a collective national effort to facilitate schools returning because that's the in, in, in interest of everyone. And uh, we'll be working with schools individually uh, where, where those particular uh, pinch points to be managed. Um, one of the other then things I want to just touch on is the, the role of special needs assistance, because as we all know, SNAs are a valuable part of our education system, but they also work very closely with vulnerable students. So I'm just, you know, just what specific supports are being given to them? I know we've had some conversation already about PPEs, but just in relation to other guidance and things like that. Also, if school attendance is going to be part-time or partial, how is this going to impact on um, their work with specific students or their employment conditions? Um, just in terms of guidance, we, we will aim to have uh, guidance for the whole staff community of schools available and it'll be very important that and it's part of the return to work protocol in any case but it's very important that there will be a full understanding among all the staff in the school of all of the important issues arising in terms of returning to work dur during COVID. Um, we fully recognise um, the really important role of SNAs and I'd be honest and say I think the crisis has brought out the importance of the role of schools in a huge way, uh, and the importance of the role of schools in learning, obviously, but beyond that in so many other aspects, and their role in society in their absence, uh, in their physical absence, has been really has been really set out for society as a whole. So every staff member and the importance of the role, whether it's teachers, SNAs, or, or, other, or other staff in the school, have a really important role. We are really aiming at, at maximising uh, school return. School return. We, we don't want to be in a position where there's widespread absences or anything like that. That's not something that we're aiming for. Uh, how, however, in terms of terms and conditions, um, we are clear that, I mean, staff, s staff who are unable to attend, uh, and there may be some reasons that they're unable to attend, there, there, should be, there are very limited health reasons, and they're set out by the HSE, and there's some more work being undertaken uh, uh, by, by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in relation to, the, in relation to across the public sector workers generally or who are unable to work during COVID and, I, and they, they will still be at work but they, if they're unable to attend, they're unable to attend. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Just, just then an, another question on staffing. Um, a lot of the staffing levels are determined by returns on the 30th of September in relation to the number of children but if there's going to be kids who are enrolling late or parents are not enrolling them in junior infants for, you know, for, for health concerns or if children are say if they're children of parents with underlying health concerns concerns so we're starting back to school later um, what has been done to ensure that staff don't lose school because of of returns that might be unusually low on that date and the enrollment process would have been complete i think there might be a distinction here between enrollment and attendance i mean generally the enrollment process would be complete now 
and indeed we have new arrangements for, for future years in relation to the admissions legislation. So I, I suspect that what you're talking about, Deputy Moore, may arise in the attendance area, but that the children would still be enrolled and would then be part of, of the uh, uh, October returns. Just on the attendance then, the, the, there's supposed to be, after 20 days a year, a referral to the National Education Welfare Board and Circular 28 uh, of 2013 says a school should strike a child off the roll after they've had 20 days absences. I assume there will be guidance around how to manage that given you know, we may, you're asking children to self-isolate or not come in if they have symptoms, that kind of stuff. There's a line here, a fine line, and you're absolutely right, Deputy, if children are una unable to attend, um, I think it's very important that that un inability to attend for, for, a, for a sickness reason or for is, is, is identified and doesn't give rise to that. However, and I think this is important, I think we also have to be very careful about, and it's, again, it's an issue that this committee has, has discussed, that there may be children who have disengaged and we don't want to turn off the red light on the 20 days because we need to find ways and we need to work within our colleagues on the education welfare side, as I said, which are now coming under the aegis of the Department of Education, but working within TUSLA to ensure that there, that we make sure that the connections are made, that the whole school approach in terms of home school liaison and so on, especially in the disadvantaged schools, is ensuring that this risk of disengagement doesn't give rise to high levels of non-attendance. All right, thanks for that. Um, one more? Yeah, just, the, you know, we've all been working from home um, and there's been some element of sort of blended learning and children learning remotely and online and engaging in, in uh, online education and stuff. Obviously, there's a huge digital divide to this, both in geographic terms with broadband and in socioeconomic terms. If these are kind of, if blended learning is going to be a feature of our education system going forward as a result of this pandemic, you know, what steps can the department, will the department take to ensure that children um, in desh schools or children in disadvantaged areas won't fall behind or won't miss out on opportunities that, that school, more advantaged schools will get? Thanks, Deputy. I think that's clearly another issue that the committee has, has reflected on, and it's a really important issue. And I think the most important message is we don't want to continue with a blended learning, and that's really, really important. We want to absolutely maximise attendance. Uh, we are planning for contingencies that blended learning may need to be in place, if depending on the virus and so on. But that's not something that we want. I think it's it's quite clear that there um, that blended learning cannot and does not work for everyone, and that in in general and the role of attendance in schools is really really vital. There have been there has been a lot of research undertaken about this both within the department by the inspectorate and by an, in, independently by other bodies and some research published in recent weeks by the ESRI researchers in Trinity. So we know the impact of that. And Hello, I'll just cut you off there because otherwise my reputation for timekeeping will be just out the window entirely. At the, um, but I would just make the point just about provision for, um, for learning for children who are not just ill themselves, but also living in a house where there's somebody who's immunocompromised and there's a risk there as well. And that's a distinct thing to somebody who's disengaged from the system, of course. Um, Deputy uh, O'Reardon, please. You have five minutes. Thanks, Chair. Um, um, and, you're, and you're very welcome. Um, can I just ask, in particular relation to the financial package that will be available for the reopening of schools, will it include post-primary further education colleges, which do come under your remit and do have a roll number uh, as schools? I'm going to ask my questions in the block, if that's okay. Um, uh, and in relation to the digital, the digital divide, uh, will the financial measures include uh, efforts to address the digital divide? Um, I'm told that students in the post-primary sector, the, the further education sector, about 30% of them have no IT uh, connectivity at all. And I know from talking to certain disadvantaged second level uh, principals have told me that about 60% of their students had to access uh, learning via a phone device. So I'm just wondering if that's going to be addressed in the financial package. In relation to teaching and teacher numbers, will all teacher absences be uh, substitutable? And would you accept in the primary um, school setting that if a teacher is absent, that is in, in the new scenario that we're facing, it, it, without a substitute being immediately available, that it would be impossible for that, for that class uh, to be supervised uh, or to be taught or to be split uh, into another class? And so without that substitute, the system can't survive. 
Um, so will all teacher absences be su substitutable? And within that, would job sharing teachers be able to provide cover? Is that part of the solution? And the last question I have is in relation to um, predicted gradings and, and the fact that the, um, the Leaving Cert was, was cancelled uh, due to COVID uh, and a high profile case of Finn Robinson in Waterford. And I'm not asking you to, to refer to a particular case, I accept that, but what are the department doing to address the fact that some students are not eligible for predicted grades because they have been self-taught. This was flagged immediately with your department and with the minister when the, when the uh, predicted grading system was announced, that there are students because of various different circumstances in their own school, schools who take higher level or whatever level subjects themselves. Uh, and now some of these students are being told they're not eligible for, for predicted grades. So could you also uh, answer that question, please? Uh, thanks, Deputy. Um, just on the first question, um, look, the Department of Further and Higher Education doesn't legally exist yet, but it is being established. Um, and the Department of Education will not have responsibility for further education colleges. I'm, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Department of Education talking about the reopening of schools. Uh, the further education colleges are, are, are treated like schools for administrative purposes, but they don't now fall under the remit of, of the Department of Education. Uh, so I'm, I, I don't really have the authority. There's a new Secretary General appointed in that department and obviously a minister and so on to, 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 talk, about to talk about that matter. Um, in terms of uh, the digital divide, um, we, we are aiming for the, for the return of schools. We don't wish there to be a blended learning. While there, so while we are looking at possible contingencies, what we're looking at in terms of the end of the month is supporting the, as fully as possible the returning of schools. And while we're planning for a possible contingency that that, that may not be possible, we aren't, we, that's not the main part of our plan. And we will have elements to support that, but the main part of our plan is in relation to, is in relation to the returning of schools as fully as possible. In terms of uh, substitutions, we are working through those issues. We recognise the challenges. It, it's, we recognise that it's not possible um, for uh, for the to, to, to leave the first cover of uncertified leave um, uh, on unsubstitutable because that creates a, 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 an impossible situation in a, in a school context. And we're working through that. We have a number of different suggestions for ways to do that, but there are also a number of other sorts of leave that aren't substitutable, and those are issues that we're working through in our in our dialogue. And you certainly given. One, one of the other options that I hadn't mentioned as one of the ways that that job sharing cover is something that in principle we want to be able to do, but there's a, just a challenge in enabling us to do it. So it is something that we want to be able to do over time. Um, obviously, we're here about reopening schools. The, the grades is a, is a different issue than the reopening schools. When you say that, that that's an issue that was flagged immediately, it's an issue that we were immediately com confident about. You, you mentioned the Leaving Certificate being cancelled, just to be absolutely clear, the Leaving Cert hasn't been cancelled. The leaving certificate has been postponed and there's a big distinction between those two things and it's an important legal distinction. We weren't able to proceed with the written leaving certificate exams in the summer. We will be providing them as soon as possible and the minister, the previous minister had talked about November at the earliest. So we are conscious and we have been worked through, we've been trying to maximise the possibility for out of school learners, whether there's two groups of out of school learners, there's students who are in schools but taking subjects out of schools and there are students who are out of schools and not attending schools. We've been seeking to maximise uh, the possibility for providing a calculated grade for those but there isn't an alternative assessment available as part of the Leaving Certificate. The Leaving Certificate is postponed and will be available in, in written form as early as possible and it's not possible to put in place an alternative for that. Okay. Deputy Thank you, yes. Chair. Um, so I welcome the inclusion of school transport as a topic before the committee as kind of recognition of the vital role it plays, especially in rural Ireland. However, the topic did only get a kind of passing mention in, in the opening statement. Um, the work of planning a return to education offers a new opportunity, I think, to consider how our schools operate and how greater equity and support can be added. I think it's an opportunity to review the school transport scheme, um, which isn't working for, for many families and which is a substantial cost for many other families too um, in West Cork and I think across rural Ireland. Um, and I think we need reform for the remote area grant, which 
really is insufficient to cover costs, especially for island communities. Um, so I'm wondering what assurances you can give us that the cost of school transport won't be increased um, and that the remote area grant will not be affected by additional costs of socially distanced travel. That's my first question. Um, uh, Deputy, thank you. Um, we, we are leaving the arrangements for school transport in place as, as they are at the moment for, for this school year, uh, for the forthcoming school year. So arrangements in, ter in relation to the remote area grant and eligibility and concessionary travel and so on are remaining the same. We have to work through the complexities of implementing the health advice with Bus Aaron. We are committed to reviewing. We had a, a review underway already, on, on, uh, we've, which we're in the process of commencing in relation to the school transport scheme. Many of the issues that, that you have mentioned there are, are fall to be part of the review, and also that has been raised, obviously, in the programme for government. And we will have to look at the terms of reference for the review that we have in place, having regard to the programme for government, to seek to, to, to work further on school transport. Do you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear the review, but I, I suppose I hope it's a speedy one for people in island communities. A review doesn't feel like a big reassurance at the moment, I think. Um, your statement acknowledges that social distancing will require a maximum use of school space. Um, with that, I suppose an issue arises again for, for small schools, mainly primary schools in rural areas, uh, which have limited capacity. Um, for example, mine only had two classrooms, it still does. So I'm wondering in these cases, what measures are the department going to take to ensure sufficient capacity um, to provide a safe learning environment in smaller schools? Uh, Deputy, thanks. Um, as, as Mr Loftus said, we're, we're working on options for classroom layouts um, and we would be working with, with schools to enable classroom layouts, maximising the space within, within the classroom. Uh, and su supporting this, the, pr the provision of PPE and hygiene equipment and so on to ensure that the classroom environments are, are as safe as possible. In, in, our, in our work with, with the primary stakeholders, I think we're confident that we can manage this together and I think that we're, that we're working through it and we're very conscious of the, of the nature and, and difference of the different types of schools within, within our system and the difference between the small rural and the big urban. And we, we are trying to work on, on, on a variation of options to support and assist them, to assist them all. And for example, an issue that uh, Deputy O'Reardon has, has just referred to in relation to substitution, that would be a particular issue in a, in a small school. If, say, there were two or three teachers, how, if a teacher was unable to attend at short notice, how that we could ensure that a substitute was in place, there are exactly the sorts of issues that we need, we need to work through. Thank you. Um, I'll just, I have two more points, I'll just lump them in together because of time constraints, but I'm also wondering what guidelines are in place for ASD and other special uh, units as they prepare to return in September, I suppose, due to particular needs, um, sometimes closer interactions are necessary um, with teachers and SNAs and students, um, so I'm wondering what guidance and protection will be in place for them, um, for SNAs and for students and for both their families. Um, the other thing I'm curious about is what level of engagement have you had with the Irish Second Level Students Union? Um, as representatives of students, I think they should be key to drafting any plans or protocols. Um, I think it should be noted that the, the ISSU and the USI needs to be asked to speak before this committee so we can all learn from them. Um, maybe start at the end first, Deputy. You, you can be assured uh, that... Uh, we have got to know our colleagues in the ISSU very well in, in the last few months, whether it's Ruben, the current president, or, or, or the previous president. Um, and we have been working very, very closely with them. And I think this committee would recognise that, that the student voice we may perhaps is having a coming of age at the moment in, in the current discussions and debates, and that their voice and uh, on the calculated grades uh, was, was really uh, was, was a really important voice and, and the nature of their engagement with their members. So they are part of our, our engagement, as indeed parents are, and we have, to be care we have to be careful. We have to find different ways of engaging with, with parents and students and indeed beyond the representative bodies. The inspectors have very good ways of linking in with groups of students and getting the... the, the Thanks so much. I'm just quickly, because the time is just, just a quick update on for ASDs, SNEs, Closer interaction sometimes necessary, and just guidance and equipment for that. Our, our, the work that we're doing on layouts will also cover ASD units. Uh, we're, we're conscious of the, the number of 
students obviously in an ASD unit is, is smaller than in, in a typical classroom, but there are a number of more adults there. And I think that the nature of the protections that, that, that will need to be put in place for staff have to be ones that don't come against the interaction between that member of staff and the student that's very, very important. We're very conscious that the students here are the students that need the most support, have missed out the most from the, that lack of engagement, and we need to make sure collectively, and I know the stakeholders are, are together and we're all very conscious of that, we need to make sure that collectively that the return to schooling enables and enhances uh, their development and their, and their learning. Thank you. Okay. Deputy O'Donoghue. Thank you. Um, the, f the first question I have for you is, who bears the responsibility for policing the wearing of masks on the school transport? Whose responsibility is it? Um, the, we have to work through with, with Bus Aaron uh, the, the nature of the guidance. We have initial guidance from the health authorities, and we have to work through with Bus Aaron uh, the, the arrangements that we put in place. Uh, we haven't said that the wearing of masks will be compulsory. We haven't. The, the, the advice is there that it's advisable, so we have to work through how we will do that, and depending on whatever measures we take, how we, we will ensure uh, uh, that, 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 that the guidance is implemented. The second question I have for you is, um, Bus Aaron put out the bus um, transport system to tender, which is usually private uh, bus um, owners that run this. And most, um, because in the rural setting that I'm living in myself and around the areas, the primary school bus is the same bus that carries the secondary school kids to school. It's, it's a double run. Um, and the buses that are there at the moment are at that capacity. So if we have social distancing and we need to separate the primary schools from the secondary schools because from, we say, contamination, uh, for social distancing, that means that you, if to be reasonable on this, you'll have to double the bus runs for a primary school, and you're going to have to use two different buses to run for a secondary school. Is the bus holdings in the country are they able to sustain this? And how are you going to do it if they're not? Uh, Deputy, thank you. Um, you're, you're right, of course, that the vast majority of the services are, are tendered um, out by Bus Erin. The, the guidance that we have, uh, again, which is publicly available, talks about uh, talks about ensuring that there's appropriate cleaning in place as well, and hand sanitisation and so on, and sanitisation on the way, on and off. I, we we don't envisage that there will be need for significant additional uh, bus journeys, but there, it's possible that there may be a need for some, um, and we're very conscious and of the and the, 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 the private sector and the challenges that they faced. And we put a unique arrangement in place to support the private sector by continuing 50% funding, not, notwithstanding that, that we weren't accessing the transport for the, for the school year after we cl closed schools. And there was also access for other state supports for, for, for staff payments. So we really, really sought to ensure that we were supporting the, the private uh, buses to ensure that that they would, would be available to us, hopefully, on the return to schooling. We are conscious that, obviously, and obviously this isn't the responsibility of our department, that, that the other uses on that trans, of that transport and other, uh, for example, in the tourist industry, will have been hit and that, that those, those uh, transport operators will have been challenged. But we, we really felt it was important that we put in place the funding to support them uh, in terms of school transport during the very difficult time. Another question I have from you, and I'm only going to use this as one example because I've been contracted around the country from different minorities that have asked me that. Um, and I'll just use this one. 40% of students in a classroom uh, in Raquel School are coming from uh, uh, traveller families, and 60% are from, from the settler. But there is concerns coming from the traveling community and from the settler community as some of the families. Uh, are working abroad, and they are travelling in and out of the country to Germany. Um, and it's, it's their culture to travel, which is their culture. But they're tra they're, 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 one of the parents stays behind with the children, and the other person is travelling a lot. And they're in and out of the UK and in and out of Germany. How do we, um, from the schooling point of view, 
is there's concern from the settled traveller community and fr from the settled people that they're wondering how can this work from the monitoring of who's going to monitor the, for them to self-isolate for uh, when they come back. Um, and there's concerns from children on all sides and all minorities are wondering how, how can this be policed in, in an area like this. Because if you look at the secondary section within it, the schooling system in, in uh, Rakhil, and it's within the culture of the travellers, that um, in secondary, the girls will not go to the, the mainstream secondary school because of their culture. They do not want them to mix with, second, with uh, settled uh, children. So it's been accommodated within the secondary school that they actually accommodate a different section of the school for them because it's their culture. But in the primary school, it's not been covered. And between all the families, they are finding it very, very difficult to know with, when they are travelling in and out of the country, who's going to monitor this for, for the health of all families concerned. Uh, Deputy, um, as far as I'm aware, the government is, considered, is considering the updating of the travel advice, and it's been made clear that there will be an update on the travel advice and whatever arrangements are put in place for, for isolation and so on. And that, that's a matter uh, that, that the Department of Education does not have a role in, in monitoring the self-isolation self of parents of, of students in schools or indeed of school students. But if, if a school student uh, is required to isolate after their, their return from abroad from in the future, whether it's uh, under the circumstances you said or after a sun holiday or whatever, they wouldn't be allowed, they shouldn't be permitted to come to school if they're in a process of self-isolation. Okay, um, I'm going to go with Deputy McNamara because he was, he's been here for quite a while. There's quite a lot of different... Okay. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks uh, Deputy or Chair. Um, um, just a couple of questions for the, the, the Department of Education, Mr Ofolu. Um, the, the CPSMA is ca concerned with... Um, the, the shortfall that's normally generated through fundraising, obviously national schools and schools all over Ireland are regularly involved in fundraising, parents, uh, boards of management, etc. parents, you know, standing at the end of checkouts, uh, bagging areas, a huge variety of fundraising. I mean, a shortfall to the extent of around 46 million euros. Um, uh, at a time when I suppose money is most needed in schools. Is it proposed to increase the capitation fee? I know that you've talked about um, a scheme to provide sanitation, uh, hot water, etc., for schools, but above and beyond that, is it proposed to increase the capitation fee to take account of that shortfall? Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy and indeed Chair. Um, we're, we, we are obviously engaging very closely with the school management bodies, and they have raised this issue, and we're conscious that. It was, it's normally the spring, early summer time that a lot of the fundraising takes place. So we are engaging with them on that issue. There hasn't been any decision made. Our, our priority is to find the funding for the additional expenditure. But we are conscious that they've been raising that with us and we are discussing it with them, but no decision has been made. What exact... Uh Substitutes are key. I mean, we, we've been discussing this all morning. Um, it's been very hard to get substitutes. There's been a huge number of t qualified teachers who have gone to the Middle East, in particular, in, in, in recent years. Obviously, some of them are, are, have returned. But what particular mechanism is, is, um, is proposed? Because it's very hard to expect graduates who are in demand all over the world to sit around on the off chance that they'll get a few hours here and a few hours there. Uh, and if they don't, I mean, it's essentially it's precarious employment for people who are in, whose skills are in demand all over the world. Uh, thanks, Deputy. Um, you, you, first of all, you've highlighted this issue of, of people travelling for, for work and uh, teachers travelling abroad. And I, I think we're finding from our engagement generally with, with the management bodies that there is an enhanced availability, a slightly enhanced availability of teachers uh, this summer as a, result, as a result of that. Perhaps graduates aren't travelling immediately and perhaps there has been some return. And we have a, a major teacher supply group, which indeed that I, that I chair, which is working through some of the issues, but it's too early to know whether that's a, 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 a bit of anecdotal evidence or a, an actual trend. In terms of substitution, uh, at primary level, what, what we have been seeking to do in, in recent years uh, has been to, with the pilot supply panel and indeed with the shared uh, 
uh, subs between uh, small schools to make up for admin days of teaching principals is to create as many um, full-time posts as possible and it's models such as that that we're seeking to enhance to enable there to be full-time posts put, post put in place. Thanks. I would say that we don't have an undersupply of primary teachers. Our, our, our bigger challenge is at post-primary. We, we published some uh, draft information uh, uh, before Christmas about the, the supply of teachers and we're, cons and we're consulting uh, with stakeholders on it. So that there, the, the difficulty is, as you have said, it's, it's not the supply, the difficulty is the, the availability of irregular work. Yep, thanks. Uh, so you are proposing to increase the number of posts so that it's no longer irregular work, is that, or you're hoping to increase the number of posts, is that correct? Sorry, right, Deputy, it's hard to talk across the video. That's, that's the sort of model that we're looking at. Thank you. And have more full-time posts rather than irregular, irregular uh, occurrence of substitutes. Th thanks very much. Um, at a meeting um, <coughs> uh, very recently, uh, Mr. Alan Mongi of the National Association of Principals and Deputy Principals said something that slightly surprised me. He said, if you're bringing your children abroad during the summer, uh, don't expect the school gates to be open for them in September. Can you confirm that if children are lawfully, in accordance with the laws of this state, if they lawfully go on holidays, that they will be able to avail of an education which is their right in September? I mean, that's presuming they, they adhere to all guidelines, but at the moment, if you go to Northern Ireland, go on holidays from there and come back, there's no requirement of... Uh, Northern Ireland is, is, has now opened up to a wide variety of countries across the world and of course there's no need for self-isolation the advice is there's no need for self-isolation from people who return via Northern Ireland to this state so it seems to be increasingly unworkable can children expect to receive an education if their parents take them abroad for holidays I don't think the travel to, to, to be just to clarify and it's not my area but I don't think the travel advice relates to where you travel for, from it's where you travel to so if you go north and then you go to Spain, the travel advice still applies, as far as I'm concerned. self isolate for the 14 days if the... Whatever, whatever it is. Of course, students should follow. If, if those arrangements remain in place and their self-isolation self -isolation is required, they shouldn't attend school. But after the self-isolation, they should. They should attend school. So if their parents bring them abroad, they should still go to school? Provided that they have met all the requirements about self-isolation. They haven't? But I would certainly say, and look, it's up to the CMO to advise in relation to the CMO to advise in relation to health travel and the government to decide. But if if that period is still in place of needing to self-isolate, we want children to return to school and we don't want their delay returned because of international travel. Thanks very much. I, I might try to come in at the end. Cause, uh, no problem. Thanks. No problem. Um, Deputy Shannon. Uh, sure. Uh, Thank you for your confident stewardship of the committee this morning, Chair. Uh, to the education, uh, the, the people here from the department this morning, thanks for your attendance. Uh, Mr. Ofolu, uh, could I just ask you about the national tendering that you mentioned? I'm somebody who's quite close to SMEs in the country, and I'm rather disappointed that this is going to go to a national uh, tender because it will exclude a lot of smaller people who would be close to school governance and would be well able to supply. And, and can you give any, uh, I suppose, confidence to us that this tender is going to be somehow uh, looked at with a view to make sure that as many people as possible can benefit locally? This is public money at the end of the day, and we don't want to give uh, overarching support to international companies here, ultimately at the cost of local jobs. Uh, thanks, Deputy. I'm going to ask Mr Loftus to respond on that. Uh, thanks, Deputy. Uh, I suppose essentially what we're doing here is setting up a framework which will have a number of suppliers on it, and our focus here is ensuring that they have the scale and capability to cater for the needs of the school system across 4,000 schools across all areas of the country. And the, there has been a very strong interest uh, in, 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 in the, uh, the tendering process, and I suppose ultimately because it's a procurement process that's underway currently, I'd be precluded from getting into detail on that. But I suppose what procurement has to do is follow procurement procedures and work that through. But uh, we're, we, our aim in all of this is making sure that whatever suppliers, and there'll be a number of suppliers on that framework, have the capability and uh, standing to actually deliver for the school system so that we're enabling them to reopen at the end of August as planned. 
Okay, well, and thank you, Mr. Fogel, and I'd hope that there will be uh, quite a bit of oversight on this. These are going to be very large tenders uh, by the look of them, and I think it would be a shame that Irish SMEs wouldn't get full opportunity to tender. Just as uh, we're speaking to yourself, could I bring up a personal issue, uh, which I'd like to say that I have... Um, family interest in. You mentioned, I think, 12 schools, you said, who are getting special support you talked about in terms of accommodation. I'd like to bring up the issue of, of the Ballygunner Gaelkloshta, which has been missing two prefabs since March 2018 because the beast from the east roared in and dumped snow, which basically um, meant that the ceilings collapsed in two prefabs. They have not been replaced since. Uh, there's still ongoing discussion about it, and I'm wondering how these students are going to get back with social distancing, and I'd ask you, please, to put special attention to that school before the return in September. Okay, we'll clarify the, the, that issue for you, Deputy. I suppose my job as head of the Plan and Building Unit covers 4,000 schools across the country, so I don't have the, the detail on every individual school, uh, but we'll, we'll respond to you directly on it. appreciate that. Thank you. Could I just go back to um, Mr O'Fogler, please, just in terms of... Uh, teaching absences and substitute teachers. I asked a question in COVID the other day about the number of teachers, potentially like healthcare workers, who might list themselves as either vulnerable or at risk. And I asked the question uh, to understand what the absence of teachers might be at the return in September. Uh, do you have a list of those? And, and secondly, beyond that, the issue of substitute teachers. Have you looked at the Ireland on call numbers of people who came back and offered themselves to uh, different departments? Have we any plans to use? a significant amount of people who declare themselves as willing and able uh, to support in these circumstances. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you, Deputy. We will be fo fo following uh, public sector approaches in relation to uh, staff who are unable to attend because they're uh, at a very high risk. At the current, full, at, at, at the present, full details on that are available on the HSE's website uh, in relation to the very high at risk groups. And there is further work being undertaken in the public sector to, uh, with, with, with the HSE to, to refine that somewhat further and to put a system in place so that there will be clarity on which uh, small groups of staff are unable to attend uh, the workplace uh, due to uh, this, uh, this terrible virus. In, in relation to substitution um, and, and teacher availability, one thing that was done last summer uh, by a number of post-primary management bodies uh, was to do an equivalent of Ireland on call to, uh, to, to bring some post-primary teachers home when there were still vacancies arising in July. And I think nearly 50 teachers came, came home from abroad to, to do that, and that was very, very helpful. We, we would be hoping that, the, that, as I said, we have an initial anecdotal evidence that supply may be somewhat enhanced but well, we do recognise that, particularly in a post-primary context, there's a challenge, and that th those are among the issues that we're working through with, with the managing bodies and the unions. Okay. Well, I might just ask, thank you, Chair. Uh, just one more then, please, Mr O'Foglu. Uh, in relation to uh, the school transport, and I know it's come up here a number of times uh, this morning, but I'm, uh, and I, I noted Deputy Cattle's uh, remarks yesterday in the Dáil about uh, school provision, about bus provision in Tipperary. We have a similar um, situation in Waterford. We have a number of large uh, bus carriers located there who are supplying uh, PSO contracts. But I would have huge concerns about uh, the availability of buses, and I know you're saying that uh, CIE is responsible here to looking after this, but I would hope that your department is keeping an overview here because I think there's going to be a significant capacity constraint uh, when September returns. Um, Deputy Bus Aaron are working on our behalf, of course. We, as I said a few minutes ago, we took the unprecedented step of continuing 50% funding for private transport for the duration of the closure of, of, of schools, which was that, that arrangement had been in place for occasional closed days um, as, an, as a protection for the industry and to seek that the buses would be available on their return. We continued to fund 50% even though no transport was being provided. That was a significant commitment on behalf of the department, on behalf of the state, to that to that group of, of of private bus owners, and they were also able to access whatever payments for staff or staff were able to access them directly if, if they were if they were laid off. So, we we do recognise the challenge because it, it's a we are a, a part of an overall wider sector, but we and we are working with Bus Erin 
not not everything is retendered. It's a rolling retendering. So they're c contacting the people, the, the groups who they have continuing relationships with, and they're also tendering. And we we are obviously conscious and 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 listening very closely to the to the views of the representative bodies about how challenged they are at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I think this uh, travel question is going to be very important this morning. Um, just to, to clarify, obviously the, the guidance from the CMO and from, from the public health officials is that there's no, no unnecessary travel, but of course some families are, you know, will find it necessary to, to go away for a range of different reasons, but obviously the crucial message is, if that is the case, to be back by mid-August for the purposes of self-isolation for the children going back into school. Deputy, that is the case unless the travel advice changes. And as I said, my understanding is that government is reviewing that in, in the next week or two. So I think I think that it's a matter for, for, for government and indeed for the Minister for Transport to set out the policy in relation to transport and then for that to be followed and implemented. Okay, Deputy Snodig. Margaret, um, and uh, like many other parents uh, who have children going to school or hoping to go to school in September. Um, I was watching the proceedings of this, and I've been watching for a number of months to try and get some clarity around um, how exactly the schools are opening. So even listening today, I, I'm not 100% sure what the exact plan is, when all schools will be open, will they all be at two, three days, uh, four days, five days a week, um, and how and what is the shape of uh, the, the school day for those children. So the p parents need to know as quickly as possible. They should have known at this stage, uh, understanding that things can change. Um, so are they going to start uh, on a two-day week, three-day week, or, or, or a full uh, week? Will the children have to wear masks, uh, in some cases visors? Because you know as well as kind of every deputy here, schools that are bursting at the seams because there's too many children in the classrooms anyway. And if you try and impose social distancing, then uh, the school capacity and the building capacities aren't there. So whether it's children or teachers or even the SNAs, and we, we, we know of cases of SNAs who are deal, dealing with are allocated to uh, cover a number of, of children. Um, will they have to change uh, PPE equipment or mask or whatever on a continuous basis during those weeks. I don't. I haven't heard, and I, I, it might have been stated earlier, but I haven't heard any major clarification around uh, the, the the way the schools are going to be run, um, and kind of what what's going to happen around classrooms that are already filled to capacity. Now I heard you mention there the the the, the framework and kind of that. The private sector will be able to help help out in, in delivering um, uh, extra classrooms or whatever, and kind of it's a very short time frame if if, if that's going to happen uh, between now and uh, the start of September. And in some cases, there is no space; there is no physical space left. And um, so you're not going to put them all into a, a into a yard, um, uh, and you have the problems around the yards themselves. Um, how how many children? Are allowed into the yard at a given time. How many teachers and SNAs have to be there to uh, ensure social distancing in the yard time, and does that mean staggered times uh, in the yard? Um, so they're, they're the first uh, few questions. I have other ones just in terms of uh, children who need additional supports. Okay, I have to go my get asking the question again. Um, I think our key message here uh, this morning, and as I said at the start, we welcome the opportunity to be here, is that it is the number one priority for, for the department, and I can assure you that it's the number one thing that the Minister has been discussing si since our arrival two weeks ago, uh, that the school sector is to reopen schooling as fully, normally and safely as possible at the start of the new school year, and that's a very important message to send out. We, we don't envisage widespread uh, blended learning or reduced opening. We really are aiming to open as fully, normally and safely as possible. I have provided clarity in relation to masks. We don't envisage students wearing masks in schools. The only uh, possible situation where we are reflecting on the guidance that we have from health is that there would be some mask wearing for older students on school transport, that the preferred PPE for members of staff who are closer to uh, 
who need to be closer to students in the classroom would be visors, because with the visor, the 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 interaction, the vital interaction uh, of of facial expression, um, uh, which is um, maybe diminished in the video conferencing context here, but vital in the schooling context, um, is is it's really really important, and we would envisage that visors would be the way and the most important aspect of 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 PPE for members of staff, particularly SNAs who need to work very closely with students in in a in a, in a learning environment. In relation to classrooms and, and capacity, we really want to maximise all classroom space. As Mr Loftus has said, we're looking on potential room layouts, again, in partnership with the school management bodies and teacher unions, so that we can have a demonstration in the, in the guidance that we plan to issue uh, by the end of July in relation to the, the sorts of options that schools can, can look at. That, that will also cover, the guidance will also cover issues that you've mentioned there. Uh, in your comment in relation to supervision outside of the classroom, where social distancing is very, very important, and it's important that that groups of children from separate classes are kept apart uh, as, as much as possible in, in, in the school environment. Uh, um, the, there's a difficulty. So if you look at this chamber here, and when we were in the convention centre, we have a, a two metres rule virtually impossible, kind of especially in the old classrooms. Um, so even if you go down to one metre distance, um, the teacher in some classrooms sits on top of the kids, basically, because there's 30 in a classroom, which physically, unless you start knocking down buildings, cannot be expanded. So unless you start using the hallways and that uh, uh, as... Um, so there are huge difficulties, and I understand kind of the, the difficulty but it, uh, if what you're saying is that you ex intend to open as fully as possible, um, there are quite a number of schools, especially the older build schools, which are not capable of opening with a full class uh, based on uh, 25 or 30 children in, in primary school in the one class. In secondary school, you have children moving from one classroom to another uh, just by virtue of the fact that they're uh, have different specialist subjects, especially in, in, in junior cert and leaving cert classes. Um, so the, 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 there needs to be as, as clear as possible guidelines. And as I'm speaking on guidelines, to Sulugum, Gemeg, Quilla, Tror, Lina, Ata, Eshun, to Mockenshaw, Gehillis, Gehumlan, or Foyle, Osquelga, the Gael Kalashi, August Gael Skullna, Augustana, the Furnaka, Insna Skullna, Shin. Um, the, the additional question that I hinted at at, at the end there is that the additional supports and aids that are required by students who have uh, underlying health issues or who have also become distanced from education uh, in, in this period, who are, who are in a routine or were in a routine um, and who have become distanced. And what's or is there a plan about the additional support? So sometimes it's breakfast clubs, sometimes it's af 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 after uh, school uh, homework clubs or, or, or the like. Is, the, is that part of the plan to try and capture those who have fallen uh, back a little bit or those who will always uh, require the additional support based on their uh, health, health needs or uh, all, all other needs? Um, and can you say, tell us uh, what's, what's the plan there, Cormagat? Cormagat, I have to. Mara Louis to Ta, Fira, Iraq, the Yanagan, Tror, Lincha, Karamak, in Ailig, August, and Merlig, and Amkina, Tasagan, Gochish, and Jacker, Nur, Nur, Tom and Jacobber, Leshna Group, your father, Gucci, and Am Jernok, Octa, Fira, Iraq, the Shin, Yanu, August, as Fader Lat, Laku, Gunyanim, Shin, Mas Faderlin. You're highlighting a number of issues there in relation to. Uh, distance within classrooms and so on, and those issues are addressed in the guidance that's been given to us. But we have to work up uh, the guidelines for schools, and we're seeking to do it. There's different guidance for primary schools for different age groups, and then different guidance again for post-primary. And a change in the concept really of distance between desks to also focusing on distances between pupils, and then a different concept on the distance between the teacher and and, and the students. And we're working all of those through, and we're. We're happy that the, the, the guidance that we're doing will cover different layouts. We will really be having to maximise all the space in classrooms, uh, and that, that would be a, a big issue for us. Um, 
I was going to bring in Ms. Anne Tansy because I think the issue about well-being and bringing students with us when they enter school is an important one to mention to the committee in the context of what you've talked about, about students being distanced from schools on their return. Okay, so uh, thank you, um, Sean, and thank you, Deputy. Um, I suppose from we, we have been considering uh, the the well-being of the school community and the well-being of our students and, and pupils as, as we plan for the, re the reopening of schools. And in that, we expect to have a broad range of responses from our, our children when we go back to school, ranging from children being happy and relieved to get back to school, with their parents being happy and relieved for them to be back to school, um, to some children being fearful and nervous. And we have taken advice from the HSE and from the Department of Health in relation to what is the best approach to support these children as we return to school. And they have advised us in two ways. They've advised us that the approach that we use should be underpinned by um, the promotion of a sense of safety and connectedness and calm and hope within the school community and within everything that we do. And also that we put in place a graduated uh, tiered level of response, which ranges from a universal approach to targeted responses for children with greater need to those with um, with a need for individual support. Um, so in that respect, we, th that is what we are planning. We're planning to accept and communicate about um, the need to normalize the range of feelings that children will experience, the need to um, put proactive strategies in place to promote wellbeing as we return to school, and then to um, have, a, have a settling in period where children can readjust, can build the connections, the relationships they've had in school before, re, re, reconnect with their friends and reconnect with their learning in school um, before they settle into learning. And then we're, we're planning for a range of supports that will be available for those children who struggle and continue to struggle to come back to school. So there will be children who may be reluctant school attenders, there may be children who've experienced loss, grief, bereavement during the period of school closure, and there may be children who are vulnerable groups that we know of already, groups who have children with their special education needs and children who are already vulnerable. So we're, we, we are planning a range of supports uh, to support those children, uh, working through the structures that are already there in schools, the student support team structure that is there at post-primary level and the special education teams that are there in post-primary and at primary levels. Um, NEP psychologists will be working to support those structures within schools. Uh, we will be seeking to build capacity with the other service providers of the Department of Education and indeed across with colleagues in health and DCYA. And then we are planning and working with our HSE colleagues uh, to ensure that there is a range of individual supports available for those children who present with the greatest need and who really continue to struggle and need more individualised support. So we have ongoing engagement with our colleagues in the Department of Health and the HSE to ensure that there is a range of supports available for our children as we plan the return to school. Margaret, can I just ask a very brief question and kind of you might give me an answer in writing because I think I'm over my time and the other deputies here will be looking. Uh, it's in relation to uh, Grail Skullna or uh, Grail Kolosh, is that there is a shortage of uh, teachers or there has been a shortage of teachers, so uh, relief teachers and the like and what, what actions or what can be done to ensure that in the event of vacancies during, during the, the, the opening months uh, of schools that there isn't any vacancies in do those schools. We'll, we'll respond on that in writing, Deputy Grimaigot. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to thank the Secretary General and his officials for. I'm not sure the mic. Sorry. I want to thank the Secretary General and his officials for for being with us here today, and you've answered quite a wide range uh, of questions. And I just want to preface my remarks by. First of all, pointing to the very sobering comments by the Acting Chief Medical Officer that we are in the middle of a very changing uh, environment, and I accept that you're planning within that, uh, and I also accept that, uh, that there are so many different parts uh, within the communi school community that it can make it very difficult to make predictions. But when you use the, the, the phrase, as fully as possible, uh, and there are many parents looking in here today, are we saying that we are planning for full school days? Uh, from September. That's what we're planning towards, Deputy, absolutely. 
but there are challenges in doing that. But that's what we're planning towards. Absolutely, yeah, and, and I, I accept the challenges. But I think if everybody knows that that's where we're heading, I think that will allow parents, the school community, uh, and uh, the teachers and SNAs and caretakers and so on uh, to, to aim towards that uh, with the greatest of support. The uh, the interim uh, advice that was issued, I think there was some criticism around that. Um, was there consideration to not issuing that advice at that time? Because it seems to have, in many ways, caused greater concern than answering the questions that, that were out there. Hey, Deputy, you, you've raised a, a, an interesting issue. And effectively, the call that we made, obviously, along with the Minister, was we had received the interim guidance just a few days before. And if we held that without letting the stakeholders know, and by letting the stakeholders know, that means that there's that there's public reflection on it, then people would say that we were withholding the, the advice and we couldn't have a proper debate on it. We were actually very conscious that the debates at this committee on education were due to start the following day, and we didn't want to be again holding back on information. Uh, we're very conscious, and as, as you have made the point in relation to communications, we're very conscious about the the, the importance for society as a whole on the reopening of schools and the importance of planning towards this as, as full as possible reopening that we're talking about. We're very conscious of, of the need to do that in the public environment and we're conscious that, that that gives rise to criticism when we can't answer all the questions on detail but we need to work them through. But if we were doing this absolutely in, in secret, I think we'd be open to a lot more criticism. So the real question is, what was the alternative? I, and I accept the difficult position that you're in, but I, I think communications as we go forward uh, will be key. On the issue of space, which you, to be fair, have answered quite comprehensively, uh, there are two uh, schools in my uh, constituency which come to my mind which will, will have difficulties, and they're schools, uh, namely St Bridges Girls National School, which has no assembly hall at all. Um, and that will make it very difficult to, to have any sort of expansion space. And the second one is uh, a new school which, uh, which I, I helped support, which was Clontour Community College, uh, which uh, is already seeking a, a place on the, uh, on the school buildings programme long before COVID. Uh, and I, I would hope that both those cases, you might look at them and maybe come back to me in writing. I don't expect you to have them uh, in, front, in front of you here. Can I address one issue which, which you didn't raise, Secretary uh, General, uh, but I'd like you to sort of put it to bed comprehensively if you can, and I think that's the very dangerous suggestion by uh, Chuck de Farrell uh, from Sinn Féin when she's sort of dangled the term liability here in front of the committee. Um, I, I think that's a really dangerous, and I think it, it's something that will actually prevent uh, people taking the common sense decisions that will help us all return uh, to work. I don't believe there is a liability to the school or to teachers if they act responsibly. There isn't a liability for other infectious diseases and there certainly shouldn't be here. But I think any suggestion that, that there is any liability I think will prevent us. The idea is that we're all in this together, not we're all this, in this together once we bring our solicitor with us. Um, I, I, I don't want to respond specifically on that, but to be fair to all deputies, the, this is a the, this is a a huge topic of, of debate in Irish society at the moment and it is appropriate for us to be able to have to have every issue raised with us from whatever angle and that, um, it, it's a very important opportunity for us today to come with the confidence that we're, what we're trying to do and we will obviously come back to you on those two schools to be confident but while noting that we have to work through the logistical challenges and we don't want to come with partial solutions we don't want to, to drip feed. We want to come with an announcement about the next phase and we want to do that in partnership with everybody we're working with and the political system is a key part of that. Well, I accept that, Secretary General, but can you, can you confirm that schools do not have a legal liability for somebody who, uh, who uh, comes into contact with an infectious disease in their school? I, 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 can, I, can, I can neither confirm nor deny that, that, that that's a legal matter. Um, um, I think um, our, our guidance are about everybody has to do the best they can. To There's a personal responsibility here and there's a school responsibility here and the department has to support them in that. Per people have to stop. Th th there's a real change of behaviour needed and I don't think we, we've got it fully yet because we're still, a lot of us are, are working from home and staying at home. You know, 
effectively, if we have a runny nose or a cough, we, we used to force ourselves out to work, we used to force ourselves out to school. We need to change that behaviour. And we, we have it inside ourselves, I think, that we're sort of we're sort of mitching off or something like that if we do that. But that's what we have to change. So it's, it, the, the real behaviour is the personal change behaviour to, to, to not put oneself forward. Then we have all of the, the trying to put it as many, and schooling will be different in terms of the approach because of all the sanitising and cleaning and so on. But we also need to keep the classroom and the learning experience and the interaction, and that's hugely valuable, and the interaction between the students. We need to find some way to keep encouraging that and getting it going. So I think within, within all of those parameters, uh, um, I, I don't see this as a legal issue primarily, I see this as a, as a societal issue that we can enable everybody to come back into learning to the fullest. Thank you, I would fully agree with you that this is about us all working together, but I do believe that if we don't put to bed the idea that schools could be liable, uh, then we're, we're going to have difficulties because people will have concerns. So we have to provide that reassurance because I think it doesn't exist. People, if people act responsibly uh, and they carry out their work within the common sense guidelines issued by the government, I, I, I can't see how a legal liability exists, but we have to make sure that we communicate that to, uh, to schools. I agree with you, Deputy. It's hard to see how a legal liability exists in the circumstances you've set out. Thank you. Uh, can I move on to just to, to the issue of additional staff, and that was mentioned. There are three categories of, of workers uh, in the school community that often are, are I, I think, feel very undervalued. They are caretakers, particularly those caretakers who are on the caretaker's grant, school secretaries and SLAs. And I think if there's any call for additional uh, employment in those schools, we have to make sure that we don't further, uh, uh, I suppose, reduce the morale of some of those three categories that I talked about, because very much uh, in comparison to teachers, they feel like they are the ones that are often left out in terms of pay and conditions. Um, I don't want to get into commenting about pay and conditions. Obviously, there's a range of different engagements uh, uh, which were going on prior to the election and which, which, which are recommencing at the moment. But I think that the, the most important thing from our point of view, and again, and the Minister has been very clear. In, in reflecting on this in our discussions with her on school reopening, that we're not talking about teachers or SNAs or caretakers or secretaries. We're talking about the school staff as a whole and the school community as a whole, and that's the important outlook to have. No, I appreciate that, but I have been contacted by some uh, caretakers who are on the caretakers' grant uh, and are, have, are now on a reduced uh, COVID payment or not able to access a COVID payment. I think. That is something that we have we have to we have to consider uh, the precarious nature that some of those caretakers uh, uh, are employed in because they often have additional employment which is now no longer um, available to them. Can I move just to the issue of technology? Um, and, and I think um, while other countries did have a national uh, digital learning platform which was able to be deployed during the the, the lockdown. Uh, that wasn't available to us, and I can understand uh, that that might not have been possible. But is the department planning for such a platform uh, for any possible future lockdown or local lockdowns, which, which, which may, may apply? Because I think it's something that was absent and that, that didn't help in the, in the, in the education process. We're, we're looking at a range of contingencies. Um, one, one, one absolute is uh, a reduced curriculum and some reduction in assessment uh, for the next school year. Um, and a second is we have to look at options and potential options uh, where, where possible issues such as you have outlined, and we're all, we're all following the, the, the progress of this virus on, on a day by day and a week by week basis. I, I think um, there, there are big shortcomings with the assumption that a national digital learning platform works for everyone. Because it doesn't, because what, what we we can't invent broadband on a national basis overnight. There's a serious government commitment to doing that, but that will will take a little bit of time. So I think the contingency planning is looking at a range of things. But I think the main interaction, even within a school closure, uh, has proven to be the engagement between the the teachers in the school and the students, and we have to maintain that. It can be backed up and supplemented by some national available learning, which may have to also be available, not just online, but in other materials, whether it's DVDs or on paper. But, and we are exploring options like that. But the primary, we, we can't remove the school 
in the context of any school closure from the responsibility from the interaction. I say that negatively. Schools don't want to be removed from that interaction. Schools have shown in the last number of months how they want to step up and, and, and we have undertaken and a, a range of research about this and others have undertaken research and yes there were gaps but on the whole schools have tried really hard but it does not make up for the face-to-face -face, uh, learning environment and that's what's really important to, 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 to bring back and that's what, that's what our priority is. Uh, and I just want to wish you the very best of luck in the challenge ahead. I've no doubt uh, it's a very difficult challenge, both for you and the entire school community. Uh, but I do think we can get kids back to school by working together, and I really support the work that you're doing. I'd like to ask some questions as well. So if you just give me a sense of how much time you'd like. We, we do have you know, close to 15 minutes. Three minutes, Deputy McNamara. Yeah, sure. Is that okay? questions from the chair. Um, just to, um, it, maybe you go ahead first, Deputy Shannon. Yeah. Uh, your earnestness of you and your colleagues today and your commitment has shone through. That's not to take from any previous civil servants here, but I think it's plain to see that you are very focused on uh, trying to get as much solution provided as possible. Just with respect to the previous a conversation regarding the use of technology, and this is probably something for the future, but in order maybe to try and look at the degrees of variance that exist in teaching and understanding the challenges that we have in the classroom and, and probably will have in September, is there an opportunity for some of the curricula to be recorded online and presented uh, and then have that uh, basically accessed in schools and let the teachers facilitate learning where the kids, as you know, are now accessing videos on their phones morning, noon and night. They're quite open to gaining information that way and at least it would allow the curriculum to be rolled out at the same time to all students in the country. That has some use, but it's a limited use and I think that th there's a lot of pedagogy and what works in this. We actually have a, a huge project in the context of Irish medium schools at the moment, a pilot project, where we are trying to have some interaction for subjects which are available uh, in some uh, Gaeltacht uh, second level schools to other Gaeltacht second level schools, and we're working through the challenges. So yes, rec the other thing is people don't, schools don't all follow the curriculum at the same pace and at the same time. But yes, there is some value in having a recorded curriculum for revision purposes and for absence of schools in extremists, but that is no way a substitute for uh, the, the, the ordinary regular schooling. Okay, thank you. And just one more, Secretary General, please. Uh, just in relation to managing uh, the back to schools and I suppose trying to, to chart infection control, uh, one of the things that it appears to me, uh, if the department could liaise with the Department of Health and see is there an expedited testing for suspected for kids or teachers who have uh, symptoms of COVID, it would be very important that we get those as quickly as possible in the school setting and, and get the close contacts uh, as quickly as possible. So I'm not sure if that's something that you've looked at, but I would highly uh, recommend it to you. Thanks. I think the overall part of the state's approach is to do that as speedily as possible, Deputy, in, in the school context. And I, we, we, I wouldn't assume that should a case arise in a school, it means a school closes because with these new arrangements, That'll be there'll be a call on a on a case by case basis by the health authorities. So I think in those initial schools that were closed, that they made a call one way. But we will now have a different regime in place as schools open, and they may make a call uh, to to just to to just close a to have a group in a class not attend or a class not attend or a number of staff members or so we have to wait and see. Because it's all about the scenario where it arises and how it arises. But we do need that testing regime so that we can get back in. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mungie, Chair has asked me to clarify what exactly he said the last day, and I'm very happy to do so. From the transcript, he said that um, if parents want students returning to school in September, they must realise that heading off on a foreign holiday to Portugal or Spain is going to challenge significantly the ability of schools to accept those students through their doors at the beginning of September. He continued, this is all about trying to keep COVID-19 out of schools and trying to maintain safe, healthy practices within schools. Just very happy to clarify that for Mr. Mongi. Um, Mr. Ofolu, based on, there are various um, um, 
projections about what will happen in September, but based on current preparedness in the department and in schools and based on current rates of infection, what is the most likely scenario? Is it every school returning in uh, the end of August uh, for full five full school days? And will it, is it anticipated that it will be possible to have sort of early drop-off and homework clubs after schools or not? Uh, thank you. Look, that is our overall objective. We are further along the road on primary. We still have some log logistical challenges to work through at post-primary. There, there will be variances in approaches in terms of times of starting schools and so on, and we will have to work through those issues, and it will involve uh, starting off breakfast clubs where they have them and after school care where they have them, whether immediately or over time. But you've certainly set out what our, our high-level objective is. We don't want to open... Expectations are different things. As I said, we are working, we are working through... Sorry, Chair. We are working through... The, the, we are very confident at primary. We recognise we have more logistical challenges to work through at post-primary, but we are working through the, those and we are in intense discussions with the stakeholders on those. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Enrolment, if I'm correct from what you said earlier to Deputy Costello, it's the enrolment at a particular time that determines the number of teachers. It's a particularly acute issue in smaller schools. It's not how many children are in the school at the beginning of September. It's the number that were enrolled previously. Isn't that correct? Uh, is it end? Yeah. Sorry, Mr Loftus. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's enrolments at the 30th of September dictate the, the, the staffing for the schools. Okay. Uh, but obviously, in the new in COVID environment that we'll be operating under, if, the, if there are students enrolled in the school and cannot attend for COVID reasons, obviously the department has to be flexible in terms of how that's managed. Well, and then there's cannot, but if the parents decide, look, the child is borderline whether they go to school or not in September, or whether they wait an additional 12 months to, to start school, you, the same degree of flexibility will be demonstrated. School, school age, I mean, the requirement to attend is a, matter for, is a matter for the parent in the first instance. If it's a school age issue, if it's a, a, somebody starting primary school for the first time, you know... The, but if they're enrolled um, and they don't subsequently go to school in September, the, 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 the staffing ratios are, are set effectively now at this stage. I think the, the key issue, Deputy, is for, for the students to, that are enrolled in the school and who then during September or at the end of September are unable to attend for COVID reasons, obviously there's flexibility. Sorry, my question is, is the enrolment for every, is the number of teachers that every school will have in September next already set, regardless of whether parents send their children or whether they decide to hold them back for a year? The answer to that is yes, Deputy. Thank you. Thank yes. you. That's clear. One last question. No, sorry, Do you I, have a, I have a... For, for, but if, if, if numbers of students who have enrolled don't turn up, then that, that might be reviewed. Um, I have a couple of questions and observations just uh, fr fr from the session, and uh, if you could keep your answers as, as short as possible. Some of them are simply yes, no, if you don't mind, just because we, we have to exit at, uh, at 11.30. Um, just on what you were saying about additional staff, can you confirm that those coming out of the teaching colleges now will be the main source of any additional staff um, needed over the next period? Chair, as you know, civil servants don't like these yes-no answers. <laughs> um, so they are a main source, but there may be other main sources. There may be people who have come out in recent years who haven't got full-time jobs, and there may be people who've returned from abroad. For the certainty of those people coming out, can they expect employment? Uh, I think they can certainly expect employment in a post-primary context. In a primary context, I think we do have an oversupply. Okay. There, um, can I raise, just we talked about immunosuppression earlier, um, a case brought to my attention, which I raised at this committee before, of a teacher who has a new baby who is immunocompromised you know, with cystic fibrosis, um, who obviously wasn't in that situation 12 months ago and didn't know that that would be the case. Can you confirm what arrangements or what thinking is there for, for those teachers who have found themselves in this situ new situation now, going back to the school year? that we will have to follow the public sector guidance which is based on health advice which as far as I'm aware relates to the health of the member of staff. I'm not sure if exceptions are made for the, for the children of members of staff. I don't think they are but we, we, can, we can clarify that for you. I suggest that it's a really important question um, and that, that it would be, I would greatly appreciate if you could come back to me with an answer on it. Um, I, I really would appreciate it. 
Um, other, uh, just would you raise there about mental health supports? Um, and thank you, Ms. Tanzi, for, for highlighting the work that you're doing. Could you just confirm there's quite a lot of emotional support that's going to be needed for different children going back, uh, which is, may take in the early days priority over, you know, complicated long division or whatever else, just, just in the early days to, to really settle children back. Can you, are you working with the Colleges of Education to provide any additional psychotherapy or play therapy supports for teachers as they cope with an increased emotional burden for the children coming back? Back into their care. Okay, thank you, Deputy. So, just to be clear, I suppose we, we are expecting that while there may be some levels of anxiety and worry about the return to school, we do expect that children will, most children will come back to school and that they will, after a settling in period, settle back into learning and, and re engage with learning. So, the approach that we are taking is to support schools in how best to provide that universal response that we are advocating, which is proactively looking at re-establishing good routines, healthy eating, taking exercise, being creative, giving children, we're recommending for schools that they give students time to tell their stories and to be able to express either narratively or through creative activities their own experiences of COVID-19 and to, to, to be accepting and tolerant of all children's experiences in that respect. This is something that, with support, all teachers can provide. And these are the types of universal interventions that are needed in order to return children to regular teaching and learn, or learning within the school setting. So we are strongly advocating, and we know that this is based on the knowledge that people are naturally resilient and that most of us will adapt when we're provided with practical and empathetic supports. And that's what we're advocating largely within the school setting. And we will be supporting teachers with that through our own support services and through our engagement with schools as schools reopen. I completely agree with that. It is not just about the when they're going back, but the how they're going back and the, and the period of space and time that's allowed for that adjustment is, is crucial. It's, it's, it's really important work. Just in relation to getting children outside, has thought been given to, you know, sort of cross-curricular work where, you know, you're getting from a, from a ventilation perspective in the classrooms where there's a need to create, you know, to create um, greater ventilation to get the children back outside, you know, rather than sitting in the same place for, uh, for overextended periods. Has consideration been given to taking the children outside to do more cross-curricular work through play outside through you know whether it's counting or Irish uh, outside is, is there any you know alternative sort of learning mechanisms being being considered uh, chair um, that's not specifically addressed in the guidelines we would always encourage schools to do that to the extent that they can and to the extent that they can continue to follow guidelines but obviously we, we can't be overly prescriptive about that with with the with the weather context Thank you. Just in relation to, say, fifth-year students who have had their this year truncated, obviously, and going into a leaving search year, have you given special consideration to how they're going to face into their leaving search year, having lost some considerable time this year? We have, absolutely. And just coming back, Chair, to the, to the discussion that we had about, to the, the mention that we had about not all the curriculum being advanced at the same time in every school. So we're we have a review underway, which we will have the outcome of also uh, by the end of July as part of the as part of the guidelines. We're looking at the areas about how we will have to change leaving cert and indeed junior junior cycle assessment uh, for on a one off basis in 2021 because of the closure and and how we will ensure that the assessment techniques used in the leaving cert have regard to the fact that the courses won't have been covered to the same extent. Okay, thank you. And just, I know you're not responsible for them, but they clearly have to implement uh, new guidance, the same as everyone else. Have you been liaising with any representatives from the private schools? Um, the primary schools in particular, who have no... No, as, uh, we, don't, we, 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 we don't have a, a link with the private primary schools. Obviously, they will, they will be able to follow the same guidance that we issue. As, it won't be confidential guidance. Uh, but we don't have uh, an inspector or, or any other link with, with the private primary schools. They're an AIJS, uh, an organisation that under which they, they come together, is there? We, as I said, we don't have any link with them. We may be bringing back a link now that we have the responsibility for education and welfare and the responsibility for the certain minimum education, which was previously, which is currently with TUSLA. So we're probably bringing back a policy link for that for that very basic check about the certain minimum education that TUSLA undertakes. But we, we don't have the, we, 
we, as a department, we haven't had a, a, an engagement with them, and we won't be supporting them in any way. But they can certainly use our materials. Sure. Um, can I just ask a, a practical question from the perspective of parents, where there is. Um, uh, either blended learning or coming back, you know, a certain number of days, or it also relates to drop-offs and collections, that where there are children, multiple children from the same family at different classes, that every effort would be made by the school to organise it by siblings, by surname groups, to make, you know, so that a single parent, possibly working parent who is already having difficulty getting back to work, doesn't have to do two or three different drop-offs or days or whatever it happens to be, so that the family can organise themselves as best they can. Uh -huh. I think you've highlighted a very important issue there, and it's been part of our stakeholder engagement. About it's about the engagement by schools with their local community, and that's going to form part of our guidelines. That there is a need for some way in the planning for how schools address COVID and any arrangements that they put in place, that they have a way to have dialogue with with their local with their local community. Clearly, you're clearly what you said out there shows why why it's very important from one of the aspects to have schools open to enable people to return to work to return to the workplace but it has to be done in a way that doesn't that doesn't diminish that return and one of the very important workplace changes that we're all going to have to get used to is what you alluded to earlier about a different culture of not going to work if you have a runny nose or a cough, but also an expectation of the workforce that it's OK for the parent to stay home where the child has a runny no nose or a cough. And that's something that we're all going to have to you know, just take a different view on for the next period. Just one last question. Em. You know, you were saying about the uh, engagement by schools during the lockdown period and the engagement by teachers. And we want to thank all of those teachers and schools who did do it and did do it very, very well. But there was quite mixed reports, actually, from schools and from schools within different areas, um, including a mixed picture in my own constituency. And can you know, on the basis that this is now foreseeable, if extremely unwelcome, but foreseeable that a second lockdown could be possible at some point in the future, are you providing now for a coordinated response by schools in the event of any such further lockdown? I think, uh, Chair, we we'll be providing stronger guidance and stronger support. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your attendance today. The very best of luck with all of your hard work over the next number of weeks. I really hope it goes incredibly well for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleagues, deputies. We're now um, finished. 12 p.m. when we'll meet with representatives from the Migrant Rights Centre Ireland on the topic of the update on congregated settings, meat plants, and the committee is now suspended.